morning. You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. That's where we're going to be uh, for the duration of the morning. You know, you, you can endure just about anything if you know that it's temporary and it serves a purpose. So I think uh, that's probably true of most things. You can endure just about anything if you know that it's temporary and serves a purpose. When I began working here at Central as the worship pastor uh, about seven years ago, almost seven years ago, uh, we were living in Seguin, and uh, we needed to sell our house and move here. Shockingly, that was a little bit of a challenge. And so there was a time period in there where I, I had to commute from Seguin to Round Rock. Now, Seguin is, if you don't know, it's you take 130 south, that toll road, all the way till it, it dead ends at I-10, and that's Seguin. So it's about an hour and 15 minutes away uh, at that time. I don't know what it is now. At, at that time, it was $16 one way on the toll road. Uh, <laughs> And, and I had to do that for a couple of days. So, so my rhythm would be I'd wake up Tuesday morning. We had staff meeting here at 9 a.m. I'd have to get up here by 9 a.m. So I would roll this way on the toll road. And then I would spend the entire day uh, working, getting some things done. And then that evening, every Tuesday evening, I would spend at the Fran's home. Alan and Amy hosted me like a college kid kind of thing. Uh, and they fed me and took care of me. I didn't wither away. And uh, then I wake up Wednesday, I spend the whole day working Wednesday, our worship team uh, rehearses 8.15 on Wednesday nights until about 9.30ish, and then I would head home back to Seguin on Wednesdays, work from home, then Sunday mornings our pastors pray at 7 o'clock every Sunday morning, and so I'd have to get in the car and, and leave here and get here by 7 on Sunday morning. So I had a little bit of a commute. Now some of you, uh, you, you commute an hour and 15 minutes like every day, and you're like, I don't, what's the problem there? The difference is, when I lived in Seguin, I lived about three blocks from the church there, and I could walk if I wanted to. Who wants to do that? Uh, but I could walk if I wanted to. It, it wasn't a big deal. But you, you, you are commuting. Like, my commute was, you know, three blocks, and then whenever I worked here, it was an hour and 15-minute drive up the toll road. If you're commuting an hour and 15 minutes here, you're going like three miles. It's just taking you an hour and 15 minutes to get where you're going. Uh, so it's a little bit different situation there. Uh, but it was something that was difficult for me. It was, it was hard, but I could endure it because it was temporary and it served a purpose. That wasn't the long-term plan. Uh, we were moving here. This was going to be our home. There was a plan in, in place. We just had to get there. You can endure just about anything if you know it's temporary and serves a purpose. Did you know that's, that's kind of the, the thinking behind weightlifting, right? Those of you that lift weights, I, I have to... I have to be honest with you. Nobody really likes lifting weights. Amen. Yeah, Jorge's with me. Now, some of you, you disagree. And you say, no, oh, I love lifting weights. No, no, you don't. You, re you really don't. You, you like the results. You like the outcome. You like the sense of accomplishment. You like being in shape and being healthy. Uh, you like sweet gains or whatever you people say. <laughs> you like those things, but you don't actually like the process of lifting. And here's how I know. I, I go to the gym all the time. I go, I go to the gym most of the time, some of the time. <laughs> I go to the gym. And when I go to the gym, you can look at people who are at, they're actively in the process of lifting. Not a single one of those people is smiling. <laughs> if they're smiling, they're either not trying, and it's pointless, or there's something wrong with them, and we should check on them. <laughs> Nobody smiles when they lift weights because they don't like the actual process. They don't. And if you think about it, it hurts. That's why. It hurts. You're breaking down your muscles, and, and there's a gain that happens, but you're breaking down your muscles. It doesn't feel good in the moment. So nobody actually likes lifting weights. They, they do like the outcome. And so that's why they continue to show up. The, the pain is temporary. There's a goal in mind, and so the pain becomes worth it. So when you, know, when you know it's for a season, and you understand that there's a reason, you can endure it. And that's what the Apostle Peter is going to share with us today out of 1 Peter chapter 1. He's writing to a group of people who are suffering. They're going through hard times. They're they're hurting, and it's not because they had a long commute or because they're lifting weights. They're, they're hurting because they are believers in Jesus in communities where, where others were not. 
And so they were being rejected in their communities, and they, they were suffering. They were in real pain. They were hurting. And so Peter writes to a, a group of Christians that are suffering, and he writes to us as well, those of us in the room ha- who have walked through difficulty and pain, those of us who, who are hurting right now in this moment or have been hurt in the past and still bear those scars, he writes to us and he says that actually you can rejoice in suffering because Suffering is short and it's purposeful. And so we're going to look at this text together. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 6. Peter writes, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. And let's pray. Father, we look at your word. We have opened your word in faith and we ask that your Holy Spirit would use your word to sharpen us and to encourage us and to shape us into the image of Christ. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as we look at these verses together, the the main idea here is found, the first couple of words of of verse 6, it says, you rejoice. You rejoice. Now if you think about the context, Peter is writing to people who are really suffering. Not just that people had hurt their feelings, but their very livelihoods are being challenged because of their commitment to Jesus. And so Peter writes to them, he says, you rejoice. Can you imagine telling someone who's going through a really difficult time, hey man, you should rejoice. I I recommend if you try that, you should duck afterwards. Because that's a difficult thing to say to somebody who's really going through it. But I do want to show you two things about what Peter has said in verse 6. First of all, when he says you rejoice, that's not a command. In the original language, it's not a command. It's what we would call an indicative statement. That means it's indicating something. He's not telling them what they should do. He's describing what they are currently doing. He's describing who they are. He's saying, you are rejoicing. You are rejoicing. So the second thing I want you to notice is that it's present tense. He didn't, he's not saying, you were rejoicing, but now things got hard, and now you've put that, that joy on hold. And he's not, it's not future tense. You're going through a hard time, but it's going to be over, and then you can rejoice in the future. No, he's saying, right now, in the middle of your circumstances, you are rejoicing. And here's what that makes makes me know. This is what I know from that. That means that you you can have joy and grief at the same time. That's possible. You can have joy and grief at the same time. He says you rejoice though you've been grieved by various trials. You can have joy and grief at the same time. How? Well, the text shows us uh, three, three ways. First of all, joy for the hurting comes from knowing who you are. You've got to know who you are. We're, we're back to this I- idea of identity again. The last couple of weeks, if you've been here, we've talked about identity. Knowing who you are, knowing that you, as believers in Jesus, you are a part of the people of God and what that affords for you. And we read stories about the people of God in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and and those were the people of God. And Peter announces to us in this letter, well, you're the people of God too. You're the new people of God. That's 
who you are. This idea of identity allows us to have joy in suffering. Now, how does he, how does he bring in identity here? The, the first words of verse 6, it says, in this you rejoice. In this. Well, in what? <laughs> what do you mean, in this? In, in what? Well, uh, that's an important note for us as we, as a group of people, try to learn to read the Bible together. As we kind of learn some good habits for reading the Bible, one of the things we've got to do is remember context. So if you were to receive a text or a letter from someone, an email, do people still email? You receive one of those things, you, you would not start reading it in the middle. You start reading in the middle and then kind of be confused and then kind of guess at what was intended. Right? You would never do that, that makes no sense. You would start reading at the top, or at least at the start of a paragraph or something. You would start at a place where you could gain some context, and then you don't make up the meaning. You find what the author meant when they wrote it. And so when he says, in this you rejoice, the first thing we've got to do, we've got to ask the question, what does he mean by in this? The second thing we've got to do is look up in the passage, and what he means is in in the fact of verses 3 through 5. Now, last week, we looked at verses 3 through 5, and what we discovered is that Peter praises God. He says, the Father has caused you to be born again into a new family. And as a part of this new family, you have a living hope for this inheritance that's to come. The inheritance that's to come is your salvation, your eternal life. So in this fact that you are a part of the people of God, you are a part of this new family, and you have a hope for an inheritance, because of that... You are rejoicing. You see, joy doesn't come out of nowhere. You don't just conjure it up or try to be joyful. No, your joyful is rooted in the real life glorious truth that the Father has caused you to be born again and that guarantees for you eternal life. Joy doesn't spring out of nowhere. It, It comes from our identity among the people of God. Second, Joy for the hurting comes from knowing that suffering is short. Suffering is short. He says in the text, you rejoice though now for a little while you have been grieved. For a little while. So he admits, yes, it's it's grief. You're going through the struggle right now, but you've got to know it's not forever. There, there is an end coming. What, what does he mean by a little while? I, I think Peter means the same thing uh, that the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote about something similar to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, the Apostle Paul says, uh, in verse 17, he says about his own suffering like this slight momentary affliction. Slight momentary affliction. And you're like, well, how could you call my suffering slight and momentary, the thing that I'm going through doesn't feel slight, and it sure does feel like it's lasting a long time. Well, maybe Paul hasn't really gone through the struggles that I've gone through. Well, a little bit later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he describes the suffering that he has gone through. Listen to what Paul says about his suffering. He says, I have suffered far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches." So the Apostle Paul has gone through these difficult things. He knows very well what it means to suffer on a variety of levels. And he comes along and then he says, well, this slight and momentary affliction. And I'm like, buddy, that's not slight and momentary. Those are big things that you've suffered that I probably will never suffer. How can you say that it's slight and momentary? Well, it's slight and momentary 
when you compare it. Because look what he, he says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17, this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You see, the Apostle Paul is saying, all of the terrible things that I've been through are slight and momentary when you hold it up against the eternal weight of glory that is mine because of Christ Jesus. It's slight and momentary. I, th- I think that's exactly what Peter is telling us here in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. He's not saying that your suffering is going to be over soon. He's he's not saying, he's not promising that God is going to end your suffering now. He's not even promising that he's going to end your suffering in this lifetime. That's not the promise of the Bible either. What Peter is saying is that the duration of your suffering will seem short when you hold it up against eternity and the glory that is to come. And so hold on. Hold on. You're almost there. Joy for the hurting comes from knowing that suffering is short. Third, joy for the hurting comes from knowing that there is a purpose for pain. There is a purpose for pain. You need to know that as a believer in Jesus, you are not exempt from suffering. As a matter of fact, by your faith in Jesus, you are kind of inviting suffering. It's going to come. And so Peter says in in verse 6, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved. If necessary. That word if is a a little weird in the the English language because it's a little hazy on what you mean by that. But uh, this was originally written in the Greek language, and it's not hazy there. As a matter of fact, um, the way we probably should understand this word if is more like, um, in this you rejoice, since it's necessary. Since it's necessary. It, it is actually necessary for you to go through difficulty and pain. It is necessary. He tells us in verse 7, you know, you've been grieved by various trials. So that. So that. The tested genuineness of your faith may be found. So that. The reason why. That the tested genuineness of your faith may be found. Here's the question. Is your faith real? Is your faith real? Is your faith in Jesus authentic? How do you know? That's That's a worthy question we should ask ourselves all the time. Is my faith in Jesus, is that authentic? Is that real and how do I know? How do you know if that dude is really strong in the gym? You people who go to the gym, you know which one I'm talking about. How do you know if he's strong? He looks it, but how do you know? He's got to lift something, right? You, you watch him lift something. That, that's how, how strong he is, that, what, what he can lift. How do you know if your faith is real? You know what Peter says? Trials will show you real quick. The words so that give us this purpose. You're you're hurting so that the reason is that your faith can be revealed. Your faith can be tested. Is it real? So Peter actually does use an illustration. It's not weightlifting, but it's this idea of, of refining gold. So when they dig gold out of a mountain and it comes out, it doesn't look, it doesn't look like gold all black and messed up. How, how do they make it look like gold? They got to put it in the fire first. They, they put it in the fire and they burn it. And then they take it out and they see if all of the impurities have been burned away. And if they haven't, do you know what they do next? They put it back in the fire again. When do they stop putting it in the fire? When it achieves desired purity, that's when. So for gold to look like gold, fire is in fact necessary. And so what Peter is doing here, he he uses this idea of fire that your 
Faith is more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire. He's arguing from lesser to greater. Gold needs to be refined by fire, but gold doesn't last forever. Uh, your, your need for it for sure doesn't last forever because one day you're going to die and you're going to end up in, in the grave and gold is useless to you then. And yet that gets purified by fire. How much more so should our faith be, be purified, be tested by fire, by difficulty and suffering? It is necessary. And so Peter is telling us when, when a believer suffers, the Lord uses these difficulties to, to forge and to reveal the authenticity of our faith. So you can find joy when you're suffering, when you're hurting. You, you, you can find joy because you know there's a purpose to it. And fourth, joy for the hurting comes from knowing that future glory replaces present pain. Future glory replaces present pain. Many years ago, I served as a youth ministry associate at my home church in Buda. I spent two years uh, as like the number two guy in the youth ministry. There was a youth pastor. I was the number two guy. And one of the things that we did in that youth group is every other year we would go on a mountain trip. And we would take these kids and we would hike up a mountain. And so when you are thinking of climbing a mountain with youth, some of you just had an image of a bunch of teenagers scaling a cliff. It's not, that's not that. (laughs) We don't do that. Uh, It's it's hiking. Um, And the way that it works is you drive to this, uh, you drive to Colorado and you show up to this place where they outfit you, this company outfits you with all the hiking gear you need, all the camping gear you need, and they do a little crash course on hiking and camping. And then they help you get from, from that low camp, they help you get to the high camp. And that is, that is a long, hours-long, day-long hike up a mountain in Colorado. It, it, it is difficult. It is challenging. You get to high camp. You spend a couple of days there acclimating to the altitude and preparing yourself to summit the mountain. Now, on summit day, you wake up early in the morning, and you try to get up to the summit of that mountain and try to get back down before the storm comes in the afternoon. And so we, we did this, and the year that I got to go... I, we took 90 students and adults up this mountain in Colorado. And I will say, hiking up a mountain is hard. It is difficult. You have to be in shape. And even if you are in shape, that pack gets heavy. And the air gets thin as you get up in altitude. And breathing becomes difficult. So that summer, as we, we hiked up this mountain with these 90 people there was a point at which people started to complain. It wasn't the teenagers who complained. (laughs) It was the adults. One guy guy had a reason to complain. Technically, he fell off the mountain. (laughs) He rolled a little while, hit a tree. He was fine. I think he separated his shoulder. He, He could complain. Nobody else should have been complaining. But look, those packs were heavy. It was cold outside. We didn't know how much further it was going to be. We were tired, and the complaining started. But do you know when the complaining stopped? It stopped the morning of the summit. Because we woke up early before the sun was even close to coming up, and we saw stars that we had never seen before. We didn't even know existed. And there's 90 of us circled up. And we readied ourselves to summit that thing. And we summited that thing. We, we hiked up that mountain. And we saw things that I, I could show you a picture, but you, it wouldn't do it justice. And some of you have like, well, I drove up Pikes Peak. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's great. There are things that I could not describe to you that we saw. The view. It was like I wanted to go back in time a couple of days. And I wanted to go find those people that were complaining about hiking. And I wanted to say, I know it's cold. I know your back hurts. I know your feet hurt because you didn't bring the right hiking shoes. I know that you're tired and you want to quit. 
but if you could just see how this thing ends. If you could just see it. If you could see the view, I promise you, you don't want to quit. I promise you, you do not want to quit. And I think that's what Peter is saying here in this text. He's saying, I know it hurts now. The hurting that you're going through, I know it hurts. I know, I'm not minimizing that. I know it hurts now, but oh, if you could just see how this whole thing ends. If you could just see the view, hold on a little bit longer. Well, how does it end? He tells us there in verse 7. He says that your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Praise and glory and honor. It ends in glory. All praise and all glory and all honor, of course, belongs to God. But the teaching of the scripture elsewhere and here is that in our glory and honor and praise that goes to God... When we place our faith in him, we are exalting him. We're saying, God, I can't do this. I can't save myself from my sins. No amount of church going, no amount of keeping a list of rules is going to save me from my sins. I'm placing my faith in Jesus to save me. When I do that, I am exalting God. And the scripture teaches that God exalts those who exalt him. And at the end of all things, we'll stand before him and We will receive, those of us who hung in there, who endured, we will receive glory and honor and praise. And it it kind of sounds like this. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. That's the view. Glory. Here's the thing. When does that glory come? At the end revelation of Jesus Christ he says when will that be the revelation of Jesus Christ is the end of all things one day the Lord Jesus will be revealed here's what that means Peter is an apostle and he watched Jesus ascend into heaven and his eyes are up in the clouds and an angel says to him hey down here listen why are you looking up in the sky The same Jesus, that Jesus that went up into the heavens, he's going to return the same way. But we got work to do down here. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a day coming when the Lord Jesus will return. And when he returns, the wicked will be judged, the righteous will be vindicated, everything that's wrong about this world will be made right, everything that's sad will come untrue. That day is coming. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that's when the glory comes, and not before. That's the view. That is where our hope is. That's where we find hope in the hurting, because that day is coming, and when that day comes, our faith will be sight. We'll get to see it. We'll get the view and we will receive this reward that has been promised to us in 1 Peter chapter 1. Here's what that means. Suffering comes before honor. Fire comes before glory. It's the promise of future glory. So three encouragements for you. Number one, Because of hope, there's joy. Because of hope, there's joy. Peter doesn't command us to rejoice in this text. He assumes we are. And the reason he can assume that we are joyful, even in the midst of difficulty, the reason he can assume that is because we are the people of God. We are the people of God, and we have everything to be hopeful for, and if we're hopeful, then that gives us every reason to be joyful, even in our grief. Listen to me. I know, I know that some of you are going through really hard times right now. I know some of it. And if I know like a small part of what's going on in some of your lives, there's so much that I don't know what's going on. And so some of you are going through things that are really difficult, maybe things that I'll never have to go through. What the scripture is telling us this morning is that God wants you to have joy in it. He wants that for you. He wants you to be joyful. That's what God wants for you. It's not just that he wants you to endure. That is a huge part of it. He wants you to stick with Jesus no matter what. He wants you to endure joyfully. 
joyfully. We want to be a people of joy here at Central. That's what we want to be. We want to be optimistic. We want to believe for better. We want to be a people who are joyful and hopeful about what God can do and what he will do. Second, because of purpose, there's joy. Because of purpose, there's joy. I, I notice here in the text, in, in verse, the start of verse 7, it's not a so what, it's a so that. You've been grieved by various trials, so what, man? So is everybody else. That's not what he says. It's not a so what, it's a so that. You have been grieved by various trials so that your faith will be revealed to be authentic. There is a purpose for your pain. So in the midst of your suffering, here's, here's a warning. In the midst of your suffering in hard times, if you quit on Jesus, then what First Peter is showing is that maybe your faith wasn't real to begin with. When things get tough and you, you turn your back on the Lord Jesus, then maybe your faith wasn't real. But the flip side is true too. If in the midst of suffering you hold on and you don't quit, what that means is that he's purifying you. He's making your faith stronger and you're better than you were on the first part of it. So here's a piece of encouragement this morning. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit on Jesus. Even even if you're going through it right now and you're like, I don't know why he would do this to me. Man, don't quit. Hang in there. You don't have to understand the reasons. You don't have to like it. Bring your faith, no matter how meager, no matter how minuscule your faith is, bring it to the Lord Jesus. He can do something with it. Man, I love the story in Mark chapter 9 about the man who brings his son to the disciples. He needs healing, and the disciples can't do it. So then they bring this son to Jesus, and and the man's like, heal my son if you can. And Jesus says, if I can. Anything is possible for the one who believes. And the man responds to Jesus. I resonate with this, and I talk about this story all the time. He, He responds to Jesus. He says, I believe. Help my unbelief. I don't know if that's you right now. Like times are tough and you're barely holding on. And you're like, Lord Jesus, I know you can fix it, but I'm having a hard time believing that you can fix it. But I know that you can. Like I believe, help my unbelief. Do you know what the Lord Jesus did after that statement? He didn't say, come on, man. Got to do better than that. I'm going to need a whole lot more faith trying to, you know, fill this up. I need a little bit more faith to fill that up. That's not what he does. You know what the Lord Jesus did? He healed the kid. He healed them. Bring your faith, no matter how meager, no matter how minuscule, bring it to the Lord Jesus. Don't quit. Give it to him and see what he can do. Because listen, no matter what you're going through now, what the scripture shows us is that at the end of all things, you as a believer in Jesus, you gain everything. At the end of all things, you gain everything. And here's the last encouragement that I have for you, number three. If you're hurting right now in this room, if you're hurting, you're in good company. You're in good company. You are not alone. You're not alone in this room. Like in this room, you're not the only one who's going through a hard time. As a matter of fact, you're not the, you might not be the only one suffering the thing that you're suffering. There may be somebody else who's suffering the same thing in this room. You're not alone. And that's why it's important for us here at this church, for us to be a part of things like groups so that we can know other people. Many of you were out there, maybe some of you missed it. We had a a block party out there of all of our groups and people just hanging out. there's There's an opportunity for you to connect with other believers and you can share your hurts with them and they can share their hurts with you and you can bring one another along. That community is so important for you as a believer in Jesus. That's why Peter, at the end of his letter, 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, resist the devil, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. You're not the only one. You haven't been singled out like there's something wrong with you. Everybody is experiencing suffering. You're not alone. You're in good company. But the company gets even better than that. 
the end of this section that we didn't spend much time in, verses 10 through 12, the, what Peter says is that, you know, you have these Old Testament prophets, right? You have these guys that wrote in the Old Testament, and they wrote about the Christ that was to come. The Holy Spirit gave them insight to know that there's a Christ that is coming, and it says that they inquired, and they searched carefully, and they, they, they knew some things, but they couldn't know all the things, because it was in the future, it was cloudy, they couldn't see, but they did, one of the things they did know is that he would suffer. They knew about the sufferings of Christ. If you're hurting, you're in great company. You see, Jesus, the Son of God, he also suffered. He suffered physically when he was beaten and tortured and brutally murdered. He experienced psychological pain when he was taunted and bullied and mocked. He experienced emotional and relational pain when his family rejected him early on, when his disciples all scattered when his best friends turned their backs on him and pretended like they didn't even know him. He experienced that kind of pain. The Lord Jesus, he experienced spiritual pain. When he died on the cross, he suffered for not for the sins that he had committed, but for the sins of the whole world. If you and I place our faith in Jesus, we don't have to suffer for our sins. The Lord Jesus suffered for our sins. He bore the weight of the wrath of God that we deserve. He bore it on the cross. That's the spiritual pain that he endured. Jesus suffered. You need to know, if you are hurting, you need to know the Lord Jesus suffered. And one of the ways that Jesus is described in the Bible is, man, he is a man of sorrows. He is a man of sorrows. And And you understand that. You can see his life, why he would be called a man of sorrows. But do you know how else Jesus is described? It's not just man of sorrows. He's also described as friend of sinners. Friend of sinners. Jesus is your friend. And he has suffered in many of the ways that you have suffered. And he understands and he knows He knows that thing that you're walking through that's like surfacing right now where you're hurting, that thing, Jesus knows about it. He knows. He knows what you're walking through. He knows what it feels like. Jesus, friend of sinners, can you turn to the Lord Jesus with your hurt? Can you turn to him? So here's what I know. If you're hurting, you're in good company. But that's not how the story ends. You know, these prophets, they, they knew, they couldn't tell who or how or what, but they knew that the Christ would suffer. You know what else they knew? He tells us at the end of verse, uh, where is it? The end of verse 11. The sufferings of Christ and what? Subsequent glories. The Apostle Paul says it like this. If we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him. If we suffer with him, if we don't quit, if we don't give up, if we stick to Jesus, if we obey him and we follow him, even though we're hurting, oh, we're going to reign with him. First suffering, then honor. First fire, then glory. Look, you can endure and rejoice in anything as long as you know it's short and there's a reason behind it let's pray